Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back. Great to have you with us tonight. Once again, for Rock the Stage show, Sunday night, 7 p.m. Every Sunday night, we're premiering great leaders, experts, actors, film directors to help you learn how to shine on camera, shine on stage, and of course, elevate you and your brand. And tonight, we're back into the world of leadership. And as we get into it, so if you do reach a global audience, we are in a serious campaign, presidential campaign this year. A lot of political stuff is going on. But I'm curious to ask you, I'm curious if you're tired of all the negative campaign ads. They're all just shooting each other. We're, we're not hearing about real platforms. We're having leaders argue and fight so much. Whatever happened to the campaign ads and speeches that talked about leadership, visionary leadership? What, what were those speeches now and those campaign ads that talked about issues? Well, those are some big questions happening here in the United States. Tonight, we're going to be talking about emerging leaders and what the heck is that all about? Is there a difference? And we have someone that does know this field very, very well. He is a top-notch leader himself. You definitely want to stick around tonight and be a part of this conversation. My guest tonight is an in-demand speaker, author, and facilitator from Texas. You know everything's bigger down there, right? Well, Eddie Turner, Eddie works with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. He does it through the power of executive coaching, masterful facilitation, and keynote speaking. He's a best-selling author and host of Keep Leading, it's a podcast, nationally known, by the way. Apple recognized it as a news and noteworthy podcast, and you do want to go check it out. Welcome, Eddie Turner, to Rock the Stage. It's great to have you here. Hello, Rich. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure to be here and help you rock the stage. Well, and again, I know your history. You and I know each other for several years now, and it, it kind of boggled my mind. We have not gotten you on the show, so shame on me for not getting you on. <laughs> yes, we've known each other since our C-suite time, and so yes, pleasure and to reconnect with you. We, we've both gone up and up and up and up, and the C-suite, for those who don't know, is about emerging leaders, executive leaders, which Eddie really does rock that space. But before we get into the emerging leaders, Eddie, I do want to ask you and kind of go off my little teaser there a little bit. You know, your Harvard train as a leadership expert. Has leadership changed? From what the schooling, the education to what we live in now, has there been a shift or is it just all muddy and messy right now? <laughs> uh, Rich, the answer to that, to that is yes and. <laughs> <laughs> please do tell more, Eddie, please. <laughs> yes, leadership absolutely has changed. And yes, it is an absolute mess and muddy, as you say. You know, the, the military coined the phrase VUCA, uh, uh, so volatile uncertain, changing, and ambiguous. And they uh, came up with that phrase for military missions, but that really is what we see in the world of leadership. Uh, you opened up in your opener talking about the, the political landscape that we see unfolding before us. That is just one of the challenges that faces leaders today. Yes. In a political year, leaders are frozen. They need to be making decisions, but they're not certain. If candidate A wins, here are the set of regulations and policies that are, uh, that will be rolled out that will impact our business. If candidate B wins, you know there'll be these sets of policies and regulations that will uh, affect business. So, so some are just kind of waiting in anticipation, hedging. Others are making decisions now, Sam. We're not going to wait. We know the change is on the horizon. Uh, here, what we're doing. We're, we're, here's what we're going to do about it. So. Politics absolutely plays a role in how leaders are showing up today. And uh, what we see also happening uh, along with that is, you know, we, I said that leaders should be making decisions, yes. but some are finding themselves being indecisive and others aren't making decisions at all. Okay, if anyone's listened to me over the last year and we've had a lot of leadership guests on, you already know he's got me stoked up. Right there. You, 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 you've already set us up for a great show because I do think we're frozen. And I do not understand that from leadership that I grew up and probably the leadership you studied, 
leaders are not supposed to be frozen. They're supposed to be visionary leaders taking us on an adventure. So how did leaders get stuck and frozen? Part of it is we've stopped, we've stopped listening. The best leaders understand that part of leadership is absolutely about what you say, about creating that vision, as you said. But the other part is, as my mom used to say, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. You know, so we, 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 we must listen. And too many times we become more polarized. I'll only listen to you if you agree with me. I'll only listen to you if you look like me, if you come from my uh, my background, my demographic. Yes. And because of that, uh, it's one reason that's affecting leaders' ability to make decisions. And we have also lost a sense of courage. Do I have the courage to make a decision that is unpopular? Or must I always hold my finger to the wind and see which direction is blowing? Well, real leadership is about doing what's right, doing what's proper, and then bringing everyone else along with you. It's not necessarily about doing what necessarily the majority wants in some cases, because as the great Steve Jobs would always say when it came to technology, you have to tell people what they need. You have to anticipate what they need. And that is so true in technology, but in other cases in leadership in the world scene, that that, that may also be true. And I say may. Uh, and that we do also have to, yes, listen to constituencies, mm. listen to people. But in other cases, do we have the ability to say, hey, here's the right thing. Here's what I stand for. Here's what we should stand for, be it as a corporation, be it as an organization, a nonprofit, or, uh, or as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation. So let me ask you this. <laughs> Is there a war? Is there a battle line? Is there a delineation between emergent leaders and leaders that we are, we're describing right now, the frozen ones, is there kind of a tug of war of emerging to standardized leadership? Absolutely. Uh, in, in many senses, what you see is for the first time, Harvard Business Review says we have five generations of employees in the workforce. And so that tug that we see is uh, traditionalists would be the older generation, uh, whom Tom Brokaw called the, the greatest generation. Yeah. Right? It was around during World War, uh, the, the World Wars, but specifically kind of World War II. They have one definition of what it looks like to be a hard worker in the workplace. Yes. Yeah. Number one, even showing up in the workplace, right? Well, long-term commitment in the workplace. Come on. Yes. However, uh, as you go through the other generations, that is not necessarily the same expectation. It looks very different. And does it mean that one is right, one is wrong, or is it just simply that it's different? And as times have changed, so have these definitions. So one of the things that I did in my work is I examined what it means to be an emerging leader. And by dictionary definition, the fundamental definition is this. To emerge means to become known as or come into view. And so I often challenge organizations to say, so when you look around, who do you know in your organization who is becoming known as a leader? They're, they're coming into view. That person who doesn't have the leadership title, but because of their work ethic, because of the quality of work that they're producing, people are starting to go to that person sometimes far more even than the person who has a leadership position. So that person is emerging as a leader. So one or two things happen at that moment, and I think you painted that picture perfectly. People can embrace and add fuel and gasoline to that emerging leader, or they can say, you're stepping out of line, you're not ready, let's put you back in your box. Is that an accurate portrayal of some let you soar and some limit you and drag you? Absolutely. Absolutely, Rich. And that's one of the things that I see too often in an organization. You, you see two things that happen there. And this actually happened to, to, to myself even. You know, my first job was at 19. And my first corporate job, that is. Not my first job. My first corporate job. So I'm in a corporate role. And I had older people looking at me saying, I got kids your age. So I got no respect. There was this attitude that you must pay your dues. Yes. And that still exists a lot today. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there is more room, I would say, perhaps being made for that. But some people still kind of have that. So they'll smack you back down. Whereas others say, 
No, let's give this individual a chance to prove themselves. And we don't necessarily have to use yesterday's barometer. One great example, we'll take NFL, uh, the National Football League. Yeah. Uh, at a certain point in time, it used to be that you couldn't even be considered for a coach. Even an offensive uh, coordinator role, a defensive coordinator role, yes. the, the the role right before head coach, un, until you were in your fifties. Yeah, but now uh, the, the 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 there's at least I believe six coaches that aren't even thirty five. <laughs> no, which is which, which, which the players are loving, the fans are loving, and it is breaking the mold. Absolutely breaking the mold, and uh, several have been successful. The most recent Super Bowl. Uh, Kyle Shanahan, <laughs> you know, he didn't pull it off quite, but he came very, very close. So still, even to make it to the Super Bowl at his age, that says something. So do we need to, should he have waited 20 more years <laughs> or should he be getting an opportunity? Certainly he's made the most of it. Uh, but yes, so far too often in organizations, we may not be willing to give people a, an opportunity to emerge because we're ready to squelch them or we do something else. I will help you and support you and promote you until you get far more successful than what I anticipated. Bingo. And it's like, oh, my word. I mean, I wanted you to be successful, but not that successful. When so the light gotta, shifts gotta, from I got to pull you back down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when that light shifts from me, the leader, to yes. you, the emerging leader, oh, no, that's, that's too far now. Too far. And so a little jealousy kicks in, right? Uh, or, uh, or So leaders who are going to really do the best in this, they have to have a, a certain amount of self-confidence and security in who they are as a leader. And those are the leaders I've seen do this best. So what is an emerging leader? I came up with 10 different categories. I believe it's more than the typical phrase we use for emerging leaders. And that typically is in HR departments during succession planning, that time of the year, they say, here are our high potentials. They call them high posts for short. Yeah. And that's historically who they've said, these are our emerging leaders in the organization. Here are the few that we want to invest in so that they can be the leaders that run the organization in the future. But I say from uh, those who are any anywhere up even to young kids going up to 12th grade, to those in college, early career, all the way through job transitions, I say all of us are or should be emerging as a leader. Even if you are the chief executive officer, Marshall Goldsmith said famously in his landmark book, what got you here won't get you there. So even if you've been successful at the highest level at another organization, when you've taken over the CEO role at this new organization, you must emerge as a leader all over again. You must prove yourself who you are and use new thinking new skills than you did in the past. Certainly you'll rely on some of that, but can you challenge yourself to emerge in new ways? And then because of artificial intelligence, AI. You beat me to the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead, ask your question. No, 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 no. Because there's two other categories I think impact this. And one is the media. Mm -hmm. One is the AI technology side. Let's go technology first here. What is the impact of technology into emerging leadership and how much is that impacting the frozen leaders? Tremendous impact on frozen leaders. One of the things as an executive coach that I see is I often will see leaders who are not continuous learners. I see leaders who've not picked up a book since they left school, be it high school or college. I see leaders who don't go back and get continuous education courses or even attend something as simple as a, as a conference. So you must be a continuous learner, especially in the age of artificial intelligence. Now, I always said that because my first career was information technology before I came, became a, uh, a person who was practicing leadership development. And in information technology, I had to update my skills every six months. Technology changes so fast. Robert Moore's law kicks in. We call it Moore's law um, you know, scientifically that it changes. The, the processor speed doubles every six months. Consequently, all the technology changes that fast. Yes. And so therefore, in technology, I it just was the norm to be a continuous learner, update your skills, learn a new operating system, learn a new hardware, whatever it may be, so that you can remain relevant and be able to support your customers. 
I apply that in my life as a leadership development professional, that I must continuously learn something new. Mm. And that's what I work with on my with my leaders that I that I work with as a coach. Artificial intelligence is eliminating jobs, literally. Yes. Far more than any previous technology. You just simply don't need the same number of people in your organization that you did in the past. As a result, you really need to know something that a machine can't do. And the reality is my good friend and mentor, Marshall Goldsmith, has just released his Marshall Goldsmith bot, a Marshall bot. Mm -hmm. And what that does is he said when he created it, his anticipation was it would help do some of the work he does, answer some of his questions. Yeah. And he said, now that it's done, it's better than him because it has a photographic memory unlike him. It remembers things that he's forgotten that he's written, things he's forgotten that he said. And it doesn't get tired, doesn't need a nap, doesn't need a vacation. <laughs> and it doesn't get fat. <laughs> so you need something yeah. that machines can't provide. What is that something going to be? I, I, let me put a pin on that for a second. I, I wasn't going to have to go back and say that. We need to learn skills that AI or other things can never erase. Or if they do erase, we have to keep learning. So you mentioned one of the words, mentorship. You have a mentor. How important is mentorship to keep that learning curve going? Not just books, not just conferences. A mentorship that pours into you and kicks your butt and takes you to the next level. A mentor is invaluable. I have a framework on mentorship. And part of my framework says, not only do you need mentors, you need more than one. Yes. And I talk about how many types you need and that you need them at different stages of your life. Because one mentor can only take you so far. And then you need to get another mentor. Not that you discard the others. No. But you understand that all people have a certain amount of knowledge and expertise. And so as you're growing and developing, you need to surround yourself with new mentors, people that are willing to pour into you. And then something that I've discovered through the work of Carla Harris that I did not focus on early on, mm-hmm. and that is you need more than a mentor. You also need a sponsor if you're going to move the, the needle in an organization. You need that person who's in the rooms that you are in who will bring your name up, who will speak for you. Oh, yes. Who has institutional capital that they're willing to spend on you to raise you up in your organization. So you need mentors. And as she says, you can go a long time in your career without a mentor, but you won't go anywhere without a sponsor. So I talk about someone opening the door. Open that door to the next level, the next introduction, the, the next place you need to be. And, and you're, that sponsor can see if they can help you. I think emerging leaders understand that different than any other leadership title. I think emerging leaders understand, I need to find that connector to connectors to keep my trajectory going. I will stall out by myself. Do you think they see it like that? Do they see it in that way that they know they need it? Absolutely, because they understand that they must continue to grow. And they understand that a mentor, a sponsor are tools. Uh, There's no silver bullet. You need multiple tools, multiple items in your continuum if you're going to hit your target. I think about tools in your utility belt. Batman had a great utility belt. Every time there was a crisis, Batman could pull out the right tool to get Robin out of trouble and save the day. I think we need to have a well-rounded utility belt. I think these are some of the tools in the belt. These are things we need to have now, right? Absolutely. I liken it to a stock portfolio. Yeah, you know, the, the best... Uh, Practitioners will tell us that you, you don't want to just have stocks. You want to have a mixture in your portfolio. You want to have some uh, stocks for certain, but you want to have uh, those other items, uh, uh, some 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 uh, IRAs. You want to have, and I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. But the, 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 <laughs> you the well stocks, portfolio. Right? but you want a well-rounded portfolio uh, that you uh, funds. Funds. That's what I wanted. So the, the funds that have multiple stocks in them so that you aren't just buying maybe one technology stock. Hey, I bought 20 of the top technology companies in this one fund. And that's what we want to have when it comes to our skills. We need a portfolio of skills, but much like our stock portfolio, we need to rebalance it because at a certain point, it may not be performing the way we may not be performing the way we'd like. And as leaders, uh, I, I was uh, reading some, some great work 
uh, from Herminia Ibarra. She's a business school professor, and she talks about the authenticity paradox. And so one of the things that she mentions is, you know, we want to uh, have an, uh, an adaptively authentic style. And when you're doing that, you have to be able to pull from different places. And so by having a broad portfolio, you have something to pull from and something to spend as you need it. So let me jump to the second one I said you up on here, the media. Emergent leaders definitely have the curve because they were born with a cell phone. They were born with a little button gauge in their hand. They understand the power of media. You and I both use media, but podcasters, streaming TV. You have been on, I think, about every major network in the world now. I think at some point you are an international guru. That's been said about you. You understand the power of leveraging media. How much is that, again, a stark contrast between the frozen to the emerging? And how much is that affecting us as viewers, as consumers of leaders, getting lost in the funnel of confusion? Well, I have had a, the great honor of being on multiple uh, media outlets, and I, I enjoy being able to speak to all audiences. You know, I, I went on certain outlets, and some people said, "Hey, well, why would you go on that one?" <laughs> I said, "I talk to all people. I, I, you know, I, you know, even if it may not be popular on that network, hey, I, if I get the invitation, I'm going." Yeah, <laughs> with a microphone and a camera, I'm going. <laughs> uh, absolutely, but I believe that fundamentally, people are people. And, you know, I don't want to just talk to people that agree with me. I want to talk to people that disagree with me. I want to, I have friends in my network. We are very different. We don't see things the same way. I like that because that challenges my thinking. That challenges me and makes me grow. And there are sometimes I say, nah, I think that's just in left field. <laughs> but there are other times I say, you know, I never thought about it that way. And so it causes me to expand my perspective and, that to me is really important. So uh, being on media is certainly uh, one aspect of growth as a leader because it allows me to lead in front of different demographics, but also in terms of ingesting media. Yes. You know, I don't just listen to one station. On Sunday morning, uh, I'm locked into all the, the news channels. I'm going from one to the other. I take them all in. I want to have that that different perspectives. I want to understand uh, both sides of an issue mm -hmm. and then make my own informed decision. Uh, but at least understanding what the other person is saying, I don't have to agree with it. And by the way, just because I don't agree doesn't mean that person is an enemy or, or, or a, a wicked person. <laughs> Put a pin in that, everybody, because that's one of my biggest pet peeves is and I grew up in a political family, in a leadership driven family. We heard it all. We heard all the different sides, the discussion, the pros, the cons, and we valued everyone's opinions. Going back to my opener, now you go sling hash and trash and everything at these people when they say something that is opposed to you. To me, that's not leadership. That's just bad leadership. It should be. We should share it, debate it, discuss it, shake hands, and walk away. Especially with the media side. Now, the camera's on you all the time. You have to learn how to play with the media, share your opinion and let it go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even, you know, when you're not on media, you know, I, I always say if you're not inside your home, you're on camera. You yes. know, anywhere you are, you know, you know, when I'm walking my children around in the neighborhood, you know, everybody's got a driveway camera, a front door camera and all <laughs> that. Right. And so uh, we really should, should conduct ourselves in such a way. And in, 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 in that sense, here's what I mean. Act like you're always on TV. Right. What would you do? You know, they, they say the definition of character is who you are when no one's looking. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody's always looking. <laughs> 24 seven, big brother, your neighbor, yeah. everyone is looking. So who are you? Right. So who are you when the camera's on? Well, that's who you should be when the camera's off. Right. And that's what we would call being uh, having good character, but also being authentic. Well, okay, so let me build on that authentic. I've talked to a lot of leaders within the C-suite that you and I both know very well. Mm -hmm. The comments have been, I don't need to be on camera. I don't need the Facebook Live. I don't need the TikToks. I don't need the streaming content. I sure don't have, need my own podcasts. They're missing one of the most powerful platforms to lead, cast vision, direct, by sticking their heads in the sand and say, I don't need to be seen or heard. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they're afraid to embrace it the way you and I and many others have? 
for a long time, it was not considered professional. <laughs> so to be on social media, especially in the early days, unless you were a tech CEO, like Michael Dell was one of the, the most legendary at the time. If you weren't a tech CEO, it was considered less than professional to be out on social media. Mm -hmm. But then I believe the, the, the politics started to play a role. Uh, we saw uh, the role that presidential candidates, how they successfully use social media. And I think that that made other leaders start to say, well, maybe it is OK if you use it in the right way. In other words, it's a tool. It's not something to be afraid of, just like any other physical tool you mentioned in the toolbox earlier. Yeah. It's how you use it. And so effective use of social media, when you ignore it, you ignore it at your own peril. Go where the audience is. Remember, we said earlier, there's five generations in the workforce. Yes. So maybe I'm going to be on LinkedIn because that's the professional audience. But maybe I do need to go to Facebook or Instagram, or as the young people would say, Insta. <laughs> and maybe even a little TikTok. Yes. There's a big uproar over <laughs> one of the presidential candidates getting on TikTok. Right. But they're going where their audience is. They're going where the young people are. So every person trying to sell something, every person with a service, if you are a leader, you want to reach people where they are on their channel. Now, we mean that figuratively oftentimes in how we're speaking to them inside yeah. of an organization, but we also mean that literally when we're talking about employing tools like social media and live streams. So that. let's go to the authentic now because you have the cameras everywhere. There's that whole, <laughs> and this is one of the biggest universal cries I'm hearing right now because they do use the media. Leaders do use it for good, for bad, or for evil, <laughs> but we're using the media and we're trying to lead, but the authentic cry of the people is, quit the BS, quit posing for us, tell us your real heart, become more authentic. How powerful is that with the emergent leaders? The emergent leaders are hit on that game too, aren't they? They are. And here's here's what I say on that. Uh, I quote it, uh, and I hope I'm saying her name right, Herminia Ibarra earlier, the business yeah. school professor, her work, uh, the, the authenticity paradox. And I was so intrigued by it because when I'm dealing with clients, there, there's several pain points that I saw. And so in trying to solve that, that's when I discovered her work. And I went, that's a great title. And it's true because being authentic, but then sometimes I need to not be who I really am that is a paradox. For yeah. example, I went to, the, the, you talked about my, my Harvard program. In one of the programs that I did, there was a young lady, she was sharp. Everybody's sharp in the Harvard program. <laughs> but <laughs> she was she was sharp, and, and, and specifically in her niche, what she does. And mm -hmm. she's a C-level, she, she ascended to the level of, of C-suite. But one of the things she always kept hidden, until recently, and she was just featured in a, in a magazine about this, she loves tattoos. <laughs> and so she has these tattoos all over her body. But when people see her, they just see her in great business suits. But for some corporate event, an award ceremony, she decided, you know what? I'm going to let it all hang out. So she wore her backless dress and they saw her arms. And her, even her CEO went, I didn't know you had tattoos. <laughs> and it became a whole conversation. Yes. Now she did it because she got to the point that she felt she didn't need to hide. She could be authentically who she is. But she told the CEO, she said, for many years, I felt I couldn't. And so it started this whole conversation. He showed her his tattoo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> started this conversation about who we are and what these mean. And so the idea that for many years, people have felt like they needed to leave a part of themselves at home, be it because... Um, the LGBTQ community, for example. Yeah. For years, the heterosexual folks maybe had loved ones on their desk, but LGBTQ folks felt, I can't put my lover on my desk yes. or my family. So things like that, we felt like we needed to leave people, at, uh, leave part of ourselves at home to be professional at work. So that part of the definition has changed. But here's something else that happens when it comes to being authentic. Sometimes as we grow, other people see us later in life, Rich, and they'll say, you've changed. And they'll say, almost like, you feel like you're better than us. And it's like, no, I'm not feeling like I'm better than you, but yeah, I have changed. 
Yes. I've grown up. Mm-hmm. I've matured, right? And we don't let people grow up sometimes. We say, and so for some people to avoid that label, to avoid people telling them that, yes. they'll say, I want to keep it real. And so therefore, this idea of keep it real, yes. they say I, that means being authentic rather than, yes, I may enjoy certain music or a certain type of clothing, whatever it may be, but I understand that when I go into the workforce, here's how I need to show up. I can still be authentic. And so yes. uh, Dr. Ibarra calls that adaptively authentic. And so I love that. You don't need to be one thing all the time. No. You can be all, adaptively authentic. And this becomes important also because we're talking about leadership. Yes. You can't just have one style of leadership. You know, one of the biggest things we learn when we're studying is all the different leadership theories out there. There are thousands, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Well, which one will you apply at specific times? If you're going through an M&A, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to be firm. You've got to be tough. But if you're always that way, i.e. the Jack Welch days when I was at GE, well, that doesn't play very well in 21st century leadership. So you need a different leadership style. Well, and I had people when I was working with different companies as a visionary leader, they would say, you change with different crowds. Which one's the real you? <laughs> like, it's all the real me. But what you're describing is I do have to adapt to communicate to connect to the crowd, to get inside their business mind because the one guy trigger is not going to work in every setting the same way. If we yeah. don't lose how the, if we don't learn how to do that, we're not going to be pioneering emerging leaders. You have to adapt. Yes. And understanding that adaptability and understanding that authenticity means that you have to have some range, yes. much like a singer. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's pretty. It would be pretty sad to listen to a one note performance, <laughs> right? So sometimes you go really low, and then other times you go really high, right? Yes. And yes. That's what we're talking about. Communicating as a leader means that you've got range, that you're not locked in, and that we understand and master using this range. Here's the other reason this matters. Yeah. How Gergerson uh, posted something the other day that reminded me uh, of the, the power of this because of the great work of uh, the management thinker Peter Drucker. Many yes. of you know that name. Oh, God. What Peter Drucker oh. said, went back to our theme of VUCA earlier. He, he said that um, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it's trying to face the turbulence with yesterday's thinking. And so this very idea of being authentic means that I incorporate that adaptive authenticity that Dr. Mm-hmm. Bear talks about so that I can face today's problems and the ones coming up tomorrow with that different thinking. Yes. And that requires this range that we're talking about. So what's the biggest challenges facing leaders right now? We're talking about emerging leaders, but I opened up again with what we have now, kind of that battle, the tug of war. <clears throat> What would you say is the biggest challenge facing leaders today? I'd say what we said earlier, uh, the fact that we're in the the, the VUCA, that we are living in volatile, uncertain, changing, ambiguous times. And that means that when you're thinking about the political landscape, when you're thinking about artificial intelligence, the biggest challenge we face is how do I show up? How do I make the decisions I need to make? What characteristics do I need as a leader? So how can I inspire others, going back to the thing you mentioned earlier, in these times, as I show up the way I need to show up? And then how can I build in myself the appropriate leadership skills and tools, but also build leadership capacity and competency in those that I'm leading? So one of my favorite conversations in the entire leadership realm is visionary and risk. What role do those two categories have with emergent leaders, the idea that they in a good, compelling vision and bring you along with them and being a risk taker to say, I know that's tough, but we're going anyways. Come join me. One of the models I use, in fact, I wrote an article about this in my newsletter this month, the March newsletter. Uh, no, last month, February, because it was the anniversary of the Ukraine uh, yeah. conflagration. Mm-hmm. So for the two year anniversary, I republished an article I wrote a month after it started. Because early on, nobody thought this would go more than a couple of days. Remember? 
Yes. You know, you might a 48 hour war they were talking about. It's over. <laughs> yeah. So a month later when it was still going, that was quite notable. Yeah. And certainly we look out two years later, we never would have imagined this. No. Over a million uh, uh, soldiers from the Russian side have been eliminated. And so uh, just just unreal. And so the article I wrote was entitled Vladimir Zelensky, the epitome of purposeful leadership. And in that, I cite the work of uh, Mark Hanna. He and his book is called Become. OK. And he reveals a secret to purposeful leadership. And there's five aspects of it. The first is, who are we becoming internally? Who are we as a leader? I can't give you something that I'm not. So I have to put in leadership skills inside myself. Mm -hmm. And so I talked about the fact that for Vladimir Zelensky, most people, if they knew him at all, they didn't know his name, right? But if they knew him, they knew him as maybe a comedian. They knew him as maybe an attorney in his country. But he burst onto the world stage and showed a whole set of skills that you don't get yesterday. No. He had been putting this into him for years. So then when you have this inside of you, you're able to go to the next layer of this model, which is to inspire. He inspired people by not just what he said. And what I felt called the phrase of the century is they said, listen, you don't have to stay there in Ukraine. We can get you over to Europe and you can run the war from Europe. Right. He said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. <laughs> I went, whoa. Whoa. Mike drop. Better man than me, because I would have been on the first flight. <laughs> and so he stayed, and so his words, but then his presence inspired people. He had grandmothers, remember, they didn't have ammunition at first. No. So they were making homemade weapons and pop bottles, and grandmothers were talking stuff to the soldiers. <laughs> Women were putting their children on the lines at Poland and other countries and running back to the front lines with their husbands because they were inspired by his words and his presence. And then that meant they were engaged. And so we saw that engagement, but then that leads to the innovation. They made Molotov cocktails, uh, all, all other kinds of weapons. Yes. They innovated early on. Mm-hmm. They did not have the traditional weaponry. No. Now the weaponry came because of his leadership. He would go and talk to, and I was really impressed by this, you and I as speakers, we yeah. know how much it takes to get a speech ready. He didn't get the same speech in every country. When he came over here to talk to the United States, he, yeah. he incorporated our history books into that speech. Yeah. He went to Europe. He did the same thing. And I, I was just mesmerized because mesmerized, I'm thinking, you're fighting a war. When did you have time to write this? So that gets back to what I said earlier. Part of it had to be him already. Yeah. He had to have a working knowledge of some of these things to where it took minimal time to get ready to give a speech on the world stage. So once he had people innovating, then they were able to achieve, which is the fifth step. You... We're able to put points on the board. And the achievement is not just getting things done as a leader because you are you got your hands on, on everything. Yeah. Because you're able to effectively use others. Bullseye. Fantastic. Eddie Turner, great to have you with us. Here's Eddie Turner's website. You do want to check this out. You can hit the QR code. And what are they going to find when they go to the website, Eddie? When they go to the website, they'll find ways to connect with me on social media. So connect with me on LinkedIn or any of my social media platforms. You'll be able to book my services uh, as an executive coach, as a facilitator, or your next keynote speaker for your event. And you'll find the episodes of Keep Leading, my Keep Leading podcast, where I've interviewed some of the top leaders in the world. And you really want to subscribe, follow that, and add your own voice because it is one of those ongoing discussions type things. As we wind down here today, uh, again, marvelous discussion on emergent leaders, but here we are. We have an emerging leader in the room. We both see potential in them. What does Eddie, the guru, say to them to fuel their spirit, to push forward? I tell them that they are an emerging leader. One of the biggest things I see is people don't believe in themselves. And sometimes you have to believe in them long enough until they believe in themselves. So I start by letting them know unequivocally that you are a leader. You don't have to wait until you have the formal title or until others are recognizing you as such. You are a leader. So continue to lead, continue to emerge as a leader. Eddie Turner, pleasure to have you on. We finally got you here, my friend. So thank you for taking the time to join us today on Rock the Stage. Rich, thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure to be with you.
Eddie Turner, you don't want to know the name, check out his books, his, his podcasts, all the resources he has, because this emerging leader discussion is not going away. And again, in a political year, we're going to keep hearing about leadership, expectations, vision. We should be listening to what's going on the way Eddie was describing and help us figure out the new landscape, where we're going, where we've been. Again, Rock the Stage is here every Sunday night. We premiere new episodes. We want to join in the conversation. There's always chats, follow-up discussions going on. Be a part of the community and join us at 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Sunday night for another edition of How the Rock the Stage. Until next week, I'm the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. We'll see you here for another great show.